Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. I am James Messer. I'll be your host through this module on CMOS settings. And I like this module because it's more of a hands-on. We're going to go through a lot of details of what's inside of a CMOS, how you move around and use it. This is from the CompTIA 220-601 exam series, section 1.1 where it talks about understanding fundamentally how personal computers work and how you can use them, and specifically mentions the BIOS, the CMOS, and the firmware. If you back up to one video prior to this, you'll find a nice overview of that BIOS and the CMOS and the firmware that you can reference. And what we're going to learn today deals with all of these different kinds of settings. And if you've ever looked at a BIOS, you know that it is the fundamental piece of software that runs all of this hardware that's inside your system. And you can see this a bit from the screen we have now. It talks about the date and time that's within your machine, uh, disk drives, keyboards, memory. There are a lot of different hardware settings within this BIOS configuration that we're going to look at when we start writing some of the CMOS settings down. And we'll just step through it and go through pieces of that today. Now on my desktop, I'm running VMware Workstation. There's a free VMware player that you can download from the VMware website. Microsoft also makes a virtual PC. And it might be nice to load both of those because the BIOS in each one of those is a little bit different. So you'll get some experience using the BIOS between each one. You won't need necessarily need this level of detail on the exam itself. It doesn't go into a lot of specifics about configuration of the BIOS. But this is a good summary of exactly how BIOS configurations work and what you can do with them. So let's start one. Let's uh, start up this virtual machine that I have. I'm going to make sure I get my finger ready on the F2 key. This goes by so fast. And I missed it. Uh, you may not have seen it. It went by really, really fast. And you're going to find this not only on this virtual machine, but real machines. You're going to find that the, the virtual part of it goes by very, very quickly. And you may often find yourself rebooting over and over and over again to finally get into the BIOS. So it's important to know what that secret key is. In the VMware, it's an F2. In Microsoft's virtual PC, it's the delete key. So you have to keep that in mind. This is the main screen of our BIOS configuration, our BIOS setup utility. This particular BIOS is created by a company called Phoenix. This is the Phoenix BIOS setup utility. And you can see we have these subtitles across the top, Main, Advanced, Security, Power, Boot, and Exit. This is a very common configuration for a BIOS setup. You're going to find uh, different manufacturers of computers. Their BIOS is going to look a little bit different. These days, you'll find two main BIOS manufacturers. There's Phoenix and there's AMI. And you'll also see that different manufacturers like Dell and Compaq will also customize these screens for use just in their computers. So not every BIOS, unfortunately, the, not every BIOS configuration screen looks exactly the same. Some are a little bit different. But this will give you a feel for the types of things that you'll see uh, and how you would go about using it. Now on our BIOS setup utility, you can see that it tells us immediately on the screen what keys you can use to move around. It tells us what function keys are available, what type of arrow keys are there, how you would change some of the values. And that's a pretty common thing you'll see in a BIOS. Because they are all very different, it, almost every BIOS gives you some insight into what keys you can press and how you would change some of the settings available on the screen. So if you're trying to change for instance, the, the way that the boot uh, parameters are set, and you'll find it's not changing, look on the screen. You'll probably see a setting there that tells you that. Now, the first thing you'll notice on our Phoenix BIOS setup utility is system time and date. So we can see exactly how we might want to change this. If we were looking at a new computer, one that had just been delivered, we may want to make sure that the time and the date on here is absolutely correct. If you've already started an operating system, you may find that, for instance, Windows will go out and query uh, an NTP server to do this network time protocol. And it will automatically synchronize the clock. And that clock is also the one that's used for the BIOS. If I use my arrow keys, notice I can't use my arrow keys because there we go. If I use my arrow keys on my virtual machine, uh, I pop out 
with my control alt as something or that you don't see in a normal computer. So you're going to see me popping in and out using my mouse a lot. So you can see the date and time are here. The next thing underneath that are floppy drives. In this virtual machine, we've configured floppy drives. Those are very quickly becoming a thing of the past on most computers. But on our virtual machine, if we happen to have a floppy drive in our real computer, we can make use of that in our floppy. Uh, in our, our virtual floppy drive. And if we hit Enter, you'll notice that there are different options available. So if you did get a new floppy drive in your computer, you may want to change your BIOS to be the 2.88 megabyte version of that. It's not one you're going to find very often. Almost every type of floppy drive and 3.5 floppy drive these days in the United States is the 1.44 megabyte version. And you can see we don't have a drive B in this computer. The next step down are the configurations for the hard drives. And if I hit Enter, look at all this information that comes up talking about cylinders and heads and sectors. We're going to talk about those parameters a little bit more in the next series of videos on storage and hard drives. But you can see that we have defined a virtual hard drive, in this case, of 268 megabytes. Now these days, hard drives have on them a chip that identifies all of this information. We very rarely have to type this in. And in fact, here we're saying that it is indeed automatically determined. And we can change those parameters if we'd like. If it was a real computer, you may find that if it's especially an older type of computer and you have to change the configuration of the hard drive, we used to have to go in here and manually put in how many cylinders, how many heads, and how many sectors. And it had to be correct or your BIOS would not be able to operate correctly with that hard drive. Notice there's a lot of other things in here talk about multi-sector transfers and LBA mode control and things that don't often come up come up when you're working in your normal operating system. You will see a lot of that in a BIOS. In fact, I'm going to uh, back up one, one view here and go to the memory section down here because this is where you start getting into a lot of other specifics. In the Advanced tab, for instance, it talks about the multiprocessor specification. There's a multiprocessor specification 1.1 and there's one 1.4. Well, which one do you use? I have no idea. The only way you would know is if you went to the BIOS manual, which said this is from the Intel specification for multiprocessors. Then you went to Intel's documentation of your processor to determine what specification it uses. So this is not some type of change you would make just to see what the difference might be. This could have a dramatic impact on the performance or the availability of the computer that this happens to be running on. You can see there's other settings here for operating systems. And here's an interesting one, cache memory. You imagine making a change to any of these types of things that deal with video cache and system BIOS area caching and the exact memory range where you'd like to set a cache. These things normally are only configured if the manufacturer of the PC is telling you that that's what you need to do to have the system run properly. Very rarely would you want to change any of the defaults that deal with some of these more advanced settings. Hopefully you're starting to get an idea of some of the things that are in there associated with that. Here's a, a configuration you'll find very often that you will want to go into. It's I.O. device configuration. This is where you configure your serial ports and your parallel ports on these legacy computers. Especially parallel ports. You may find on the newer printers that you need to have a printer port that not only communicates out to the printer, but the printers these days will also communicate information back about the amount of ink left in an ink cartridge or it will tell the, the computer that a paper has jammed. And you can change these to be enhanced. They can be standard bidirectional. And that's another situation where you want to go to the manufacturer of the printer and find out in the, the, the configuration there how, what does the printer support. And then you're going to want to match it in the BIOS of the, of the computer that you're using. If we look down at some of the other advanced chipset controls, you can start to see you can go very deep into configurations of memory, configurations of timings, configurations of caching. This is how when people start overclocking computers, they start to go into some of these other configurations and set these differently. Oftentimes they'll set them so they're, they're a little bit different than the normal. They'll tweak it just a bit to get a little bit more horsepower out of it. 
If you've ever turned on a computer and found that it asks you for a password, that's probably because it's giving you this option within the BIOS itself. And that's where you'd set things like a user password or a supervisor password. You can start to see here, this is how you can make your system even more secure. The problem is if you forget your password, you're probably going to have to take that, that uh, power power source, a battery, off of the motherboard so that it will clear the CMOS and you can go back in and configure it. There's oftentimes a jumper you can set as well so that you can set those things properly. Another setting you're going to run into often is the boot setting. And this boot configuration defines what boots first. Do you go to a floppy drive first? Do you go to a hard drive first? Do you go to a USB key second? Do you go to the hard drive last after you've tried everything else? And different people like their configurations different ways. So if you look in here, you can see that it, tells, it starts with removable devices. It goes to the CD-ROM drive. It goes to the hard drive. And if it can't find any of those, it goes to the network card and starts asking anything on the network if it can boot from a special boot file that's located on a server on the network. You don't see that very often, but some large organizations will do things that way so that the system has no drives in it whatsoever. You can also see I'm going to back up to the power. This is also where you're going to find configurations for power management. And if you find that your system is set up that can support some of these advanced configuration and power settings, you may find a BIOS that is also compatible with that. So you're going to want to make sure that those things work and are supported with each other. Finally, on the exit setting, you're going to see that you can exit saving these changes. You could say, well, you know what, I made a lot of changes in here. And I'm not quite certain I'm comfortable with them. I want to exit and discard all of the changes I did. What's nice about this particular BIOS version is it will save the setup information to CMOS. I can also load the defaults from there as well. And ultimately, I could say discard everything that we've done in here. And let's just start over again with what we were doing without exiting. So all of these BIOS configuration settings are there for you to change the configuration of the hardware itself and make sure that your system stays up and running all the time. So when you change software, when you add new pieces of hardware, you may have to find that you're going into your BIOS to make a change here so that it will recognize the new hardware that you've put into it. In review, we've looked at a lot of different configurations within our BIOS, and we could have made a lot of different changes to the CMOS settings that are within there. We've gone through not only the hard drives, the memory, the serial ports. We've looked at date and time, even passwords and boot sequences. And all of this information you can see deals with the raw basic hardware inside of your computer. So if you're ever trying to figure out why is a serial port on the back of my computer not working, the BIOS may be a good place to look to see if it's configured properly, if it's even enabled. And now you know exactly how to get in there and have a look at that. For more CompTIA certification videos, we've got a lot more on our website. Not only that, but message boards and discussion groups. And I've got some study guides out there for you as well. You can visit our website, freeaplus.com.